to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ who knows whether you've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther chapter 4, verse number 14. Welcome to our study of the book of Esther in our Old Testament series. In these lessons, we've been trying to take the living message of each book, the things that were written aforetime or written for our learning, Romans 15, 4, and apply these powerful lessons to today. And no message speaks greater to our need and privilege of working in the kingdom than the message of Esther 4 verse 14. The great servant of God and hero Mordecai says to his niece and adopted daughter, Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In a time of difficulty and crisis, Mordecai reminded Esther and all of us that we must use our talents and abilities in the kingdom of God and to His service, which really ought to be our first and foremost priority in all things. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God. Esther is one of those unique books in the Old Testament in which there's a lot of providence and a lot of protection of God seen, and yet at the same time, God's not mentioned by name as much in the book. Key word or idea behind the book is that of God's protection and providence. That is, God's working through the nations. And God is ultimately working out His plan so that His people and His plan are saved. And ultimately, Jesus can come into the world and bring salvation. As we mentioned, key verse... Esther 4 verse 14 reminds us of our place and our need to be faithful in the kingdom of God for such a time as this. What am I going to do and what are you going to do in the kingdom to make an impact for God and for His great cause? Key chapter, Esther chapter 8 is the key chapter where kind of as the story unfolds, Esther and Mordecai, they will not submit to nor bow down to the evil, ungodly pagan king Ahasuerus. Now, Haman, who is a worker for Ahasuerus, he sees this and it bothers him. It, it greatly displeases him to see the Jews and them worship their God and not the gods of the pagans. And so he comes up with this plan that he is going to cause Israel to be brought down through Mordecai and, and thus God's working unfolds in Esther as she will eventually save her people. But you know one of the key ideas is found in chapter 8 where really the tables are flipped on Haman. Haman has made this decree. It looks like Mordecai and all the Jews are going to be destroyed and yet through the providence of God working in Mordecai and Esther the very gallows that Haman made to have Mordecai hanged on, he himself is hanged on, and the Jews come out victorious. You know, as I think about this powerful lesson, I'm reminded that in this life, and ultimately, the Bible promises that God's people will be taken care of. All things work out for good to those who love the Lord. Romans 8, 28. If not in this life, you can be sure that on the other side, God's children will be blessed and will have that heavenly home. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so as we think about Haman and his plight and the things unfolding, the key message is that, that God's hand of care and protection is always upon those who trust in Him. We each have to ask ourselves and, and look inside ourselves and make sure, am I really trusting God? You know, we hear those ever familiar words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We hear that, we, we sing songs like trust and obey, but when it comes right down to it, do we really trust God? Are we willing to trust God even when we can't see the way? 
even when the way looks difficult. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? He Himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What shall man do unto me? And so as we think about God and ultimately God's plan, how we need to know our God will always take care of His people. Now, just some interesting facts about the book of Esther itself. Esther, what's uni one of the unique things about it is, it's the only book in the Bible where the name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah, where the name of God never appears in this book. Now you think about that. God's not mentioned even one time in the book of Esther, and yet, as someone rightly said, if the name of God is not there, His finger is on every page. Friend, you can't read the book of Esther without seeing the, the hand of God in working through and even controlling world events to bring about His ultimate plan. Now, as we mentioned, Esther shows us how we've got to trust God and how that God will take care of His people. Let's put that in perspective of the whole plan of God. The Israelites are only a small part, probably a very small part, in this plan. Did God save the Israelites and does that ultimately look like that's what the book is all about? Yeah, the Israelites even had a feast relative to this in which they remembered how God caused their people to survive. Feast of Purim, but here's what's even more interesting. It wasn't just God saving the Israelites in the book of Esther. When God saved that Israelite nation, what did He really do? He perpetuated that lineage. And as you open up to Matthew 1 or Luke chapter 3, and as we read those names inscribed there in the lineage of Jesus, we're reminded that when God saved Israel there, God also managed the unfolding of His plan. Even through an evil, ungodly nation, He worked at times to bring about salvation. You know, when I hear the words, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. When, when I see that God so loved the world, He gave, do I, do I remember books like Esther where God ma marvelously worked through these unfolding events to bring His great plan into fruition? Now the name Esther itself is a Persian name which means star and she indeed is the star of this book. Let's just kind of lay out kind of the, the, the main players, the main people in this book and how God works through them. First we have King Ahasuerus. He's the king of Persia. Persia is not a God-fearing nation per se, but they're reigning over the people of Israel due to captivity and things of that nature. Vashti is Ahasuerus queen at the opening of the book. She is deposed because she won't do certain things which ultimately would not have been right for her to do. Mordecai, the main hero in the book I believe, not Esther, but Mordecai is the main hero in that he is the uncle and counselor of Esther. He kind of serves as a role model, building her faith up, encouraging her to do the right thing, and the stands he takes throughout the book, even when his life is put on the line, show the great faith that Mordecai had in the plan of God and in God himself. Esther is a Jewish maiden who, during the selection of a new queen after Vashti is deposed, rises to the throne, and it seems like naturally just an unfolding of events. But oh, it's so much more than that. You can see the hand of God in the fact that Esther is selected and that in this selection she will ultimately save her people and perpetuate the lineage, that seed lineage. Now, there's one other person that we need to mention in this plot, in this book, and that is Haman. Haman is a prince under King Ahasuerus, probably the highest of all the princes, and yet this man begrudges the Jews, mainly because Mordecai won't fall down and bow before him and, and worship like they do and give in to the pagan things they do. And so naturally that would make Haman unhappy. Haman then takes a grudge a little further. He gets Xerxes, Ahasuerus, to sign a decree which cannot be altered that the Jews are to be extinguished on a certain day. 
And through the unfolding of these events, as we'll see in the book of Esther, God's hand marvelously begins to work in saving His people and ultimately bringing the Christ into the world. Now, let's think for just a moment about some of these living messages in the book of Esther that so aptly apply to our lives today. You know, as I think about making this book practical and how the messages jump off the page into our lives today, I can't help but think of the stand that Queen Vashti took that even caused her to be deposed as queen. I want you to notice Esther chapter 1 beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says in Esther chapter 1, verse 11, <clears throat> that Queen Vashti was called before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. You know, as I think about what Vashti did here, she took a stand for right. Some suggest that when she came, she would have been dressed only wearing her crown. Others suggest that she would have been paraded as some animal or so for some sport to show her beauty. Whatever the case, she wasn't going to be seen just as a sex symbol for her beauty and her appeal. She wasn't going to be living that type of life. And even to the point, that she refused the order of the king, which would have meant, in many ways could have meant, death for her. No doubt she was deposed. What do we learn from this woman, this pagan queen? Even a powerful lesson here is seen for all men and women today. And that is, we've got to learn. Young people, I hope you'll listen real carefully. You've got to learn to see yourself. And don't let the world and the media shape you into just seeing yourself as a, an appeal, a sex symbol, and that way a, a lustful appeal. No, the, there's so much more to life in the body than that. You know, every commercial that you see, whether it be a beer commercial, whether it be a clothing commercial, has that, that sex appeal behind it. And it seems that that's how our world is driven today, based on the sex symbols of men and women. And yet Vashti wouldn't stand for that. And my friends, Christians, Christian men and women shouldn't stand for that today either. The Bible says that we're to dress modestly, we're to dress appropriately as those professing godliness would. 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 11. We ought not to let our first impression be silver or gold or, or braided hair or pearls or costly clothing. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart incorruptible beauty, which is very precious in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3, verses 4 through 9. And so when we think about what makes a person unique, it's not this. It's what's inside. It's whether I put God first. It's whether I'm willing to take a stand for right and do the right thing no matter what. Then as Vashti is deposed, in Esther chapter 2, we see a transition of event, of events beginning to unfold. Now the king is going to make a new selection, or the king's going to make a new selection for a queen. Multiple maidens throughout the province are brought. Esther is brought in with them. And, and Esther basically goes from being an orphan to the queen of Persia. Why did God do that? Well, we ultimately know from the plot of the book that God is going to use Esther to save His people. But, but look at how Esther worked in all this. From orphan to queen, my friend, God is able to take us and use our talents, regardless of what they are, to His glory. Now, I want you to stop and think about your life and my life as we live in the kingdom. Matthew 25 teaches that we all have talents. Some were given one talent, some two talent, some five talents. Here's the interesting thing. There was no zero talent man. Everybody has a talent, an ability, something they can take and use to the glory of God. And, and I'm convinced as you watch throughout history, if I'll take what I've been given, if I'll shape it, sharpen it, hone it, and put it to use in the right direction, I'm convinced God can take that and not only work with it, 
but make it work in His kingdom and multiply its ability beyond what we even can imagine. And so we ask ourselves, are we, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, I was born in this situation and that's just the, the, the deck of cards. That's just the hand that life dealt me. Oh, think about all the people who could have used that excuse. Could have said, well, that's just the hand. Esther could have said, I was born an orphan and I'll never be anything else. And that's just the way the hand that life dealt me and society gave me. No, don't use that excuse. Say to yourself, I'm important to God. God has created me with an eternal soul. And if I'll use that, use what I've got. We don't all have the same talent. But if I'll take what I've got, use it and sharpen it. God can definitely make that profitable in His glory. Now, as we think about the events unfolding, in chapter 2, a very interesting scene happens. Mordecai now begins to come onto the scene, and, and Mordecai, in essence, he sees a plot unfolding where someone is trying to take the king's life. And, and he goes and tells about this plot, and as a result, it's written in the annals, and, and the king's life is saved. Now, that's important, and we're going to see why a little bit later as God is going to use that. But in the process of events, in chapter 3, Haman is now going to enter the scene. He is definitely a worker of Satan, an enemy, and a critic of the Jews and of their religion. He's greatly displeased with Mordecai doesn't know that Esther is a Jew yet, but he knows Mordecai is. And so because Mordecai won't do what Haman thinks he ought to, he's now going to enter into this plot a way of taking out the Jews permanently. He tells the king about this people. There is this people in our land who, if we can paraphrase, are basically a nuisance. They don't follow your laws. They don't worship you. They're from an old group of people who basically are set in their ways and really they're causing a lot of problems in the kingdom. It'd be, be in your best interest in a political sense to just have them eliminated. Now, you don't need to be the one to kill them, he says, but if you'll make this decree that all people in all provinces on a given day can go in and destroy this unsightly people, then that would be best for your political future. That scene of events now takes place. The king signs the decree. He sets the motion, the wheels into motion. And so now, on this day, in the future, it looks like all Israel is going to be wiped out. Then enter chapter 4, where Mordecai finds out about this plot, this scheme that's unfolding. He tells Esther, they go into a sense of, of, of meditating and thinking about what they can do. And now, here's where those words come. Mordecai says to Esther, Who knows whether you've been called into the kingdom for such a time as this? But then he says this, One thing's certain, if you don't do it, you may die and you may perish, but God will bring up somebody. He'll raise up somebody to do it. And, and so Esther is a great woman of faith. And as a woman of faith, she now puts her trust in Mordecai and more importantly, in God. And as a result, my friends, Esther, which is unheard of in those days, goes into the king. He extends that scepter to her, allows her to speak, and she begins to untell or tell about this plot and the things that have been done and how it's that wicked Haman who's done that. Haman begins to beg for his life, you remember? He's in the very couch of Esther. Uh, she's on the couch. He's there with her. He lays in her lap and is begging for his life, and the king comes in and sees and Haman eventually is hanged on, the own, on his own gallows that he built to hang Mordecai on. But as you think about these things, remember again the faith that it took in Esther to do this. Her life was on the line. She'd already seen one queen dethroned for rising up and challenging the king, and, and now she's going to go and pretty much have to do the same thing. And yet she musters up the courage and really the faith in God to do what needed to be done regardless. Friends, when I think about how we need more people like this in the church, here's how I think things like this apply today. We're living in a very precarious day and age today. There are many things that it is not popular 
for a Christian to speak about. Many things that even will bring us harm in some ways if we do. And yet as Christians, we've got to have the faith in God and the courage to stand up and speak out about things, whether it be moral wrongs, abortion, gay marriage, euthanasia, homosexuality. In a world that doesn't want to hear about that, like Esther, we need the faith to stand up, to side with God, and to say the things that God wants us to say. Now, interesting things begin to happen as we watch the book unfold. Esther begins to uh, set up a banquet, and that banquet, it eventually shows the pride of Haman, and he's eventually hanged in his own gallows. But I want you to remember a story that occurs in the midst of that. Haman is coming into the courtyard, and as he comes into the courtyard, he's thinking to himself, what greater thing? The king has this He's read in these annals. He's not been able to sleep. And so he's been reading in the annals. And in chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, we mentioned that Mordecai told about this plot to kill the king. Do you remember that great story, how that unfolded and how we said that would be critical? Well, now the king has not been sleeping well, so he stayed up at night. And one night he's reading these annals. And so he, Haman comes into the courtyard. And he begins to ask Haman some questions. What shall be done for the man who the king delights in? And, and Haman unfolds this great thing. Take some of the, one of the king's own horses and place a great robe on him and, and have some of the king's own favorite princes go around the courtyard with him and, and make this great parade and show. And Haman, of course, says to himself, Well, who's greater than me? And who does the king delight, desire to delight in more than me? And little does he know. Watch the unfolding of God here. Haman tried to have Mordecai put to death and hanged on gallows. And now Mordecai is the very man the king is thinking of. He tells Haman, go get Mordecai, put him on the horse, put him in a purple or a scarlet robe, ride him around and parade before the people and tell what great things he's done. And so you can see the, the anger and the white-hot fury of Haman as God flips the tables on him and as God's people are ultimately the ones who are given glory and honor in this great day. But there's still a problem. The king has made a decree. That decree cannot be altered. On that set, regardless of whether Haman lives or not, on that set day, all Jews everywhere are still going to be put to death. And so there's no way of changing that. What can be done? Well, Esther, she again goes into the king. She makes this new plan, if you will. And in this plan, not only does it lead to the salvation, but the continued protection of the Israelites. She says to the king, we know we can't change what Haman did in essence, but she says, let's make a new decree. And the king, because he loves her and because he realizes the state she serves in the, in the kingdom with him for, they make a new plan. And on this day, all the Jews are commanded to defend themselves. As a result of that decree, not only do they defend themselves, but they receive protection from the people in Persia to not only defend them, but to help defend them. And so Haman is already dead. All his sons are eventually killed. His family is extinguished. And all those who are trying to do harm to the people of God, many of those die on that day. And so can you see in the book of Esther, God's great care and protection for His people, it looked like the whole Jewish nation was going to be wiped out. And yet through two faithful people, Mordecai, one of the most courageous men in all the Bible, and Esther for her great virtue and faith, they end up playing a major role in saving Israel and as we've suggested, in ultimately perpetuating that lineage of Christ and of salvation. You know, we say to ourselves sometimes, I can never do great things like that. And yet, who knows whether you've been called, whether I've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. I don't know what the future holds. You don't know what the future holds. I've seen countless people, and so have you, who did small, what we thought were small things in the Bible, and yet they ended up having grand results in the great scheme of things. Here's what I do know, and here's what you know. If we're faithful unto death, the Lord promises us the crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10. I know God will take care of me. 
the Bible says all things will ultimately work together for good. If I live faithfully, if I stand for the truth, if I do what's right, no matter what the consequences may be, it'll all work out in the end. Friend, you can rest assured of that. Are we really living faithful to God? Friend, we ask you today to consider this. Are you even a child of God? Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation and become one of His children whom He loves and cares for deeply? If you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that today. What does the Bible teach you've got to do to become a Christian? Well, no doubt, you have to have faith in God. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. I, I must believe, I must hear this Word and believe it as the truth and have that faith to do what God says. But it's not faith alone that saves. James 2, 24 clearly says faith alone will not save. I then must be willing to change my life and repent. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. That means I've got to turn from sin and turn to God, change my way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. Then I must make the good confession, just as the Ethiopian eunuch did, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Acts chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. And then Jesus said, and many New Testament writers said, you've got to be baptized to be saved. Hear the words of Jesus. Jesus so plainly said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did you hear what two qualifications there were to be saved? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter later said in 1 Peter 3.21, Baptism does now also save us. If you're not a child of God, we encourage you to become one. And, and if as a child of God, maybe you've not been putting full faith and trust in God and, and letting Him use you, if nothing else from the book of Esther, realize that if, if you'll be faithful and if you'll take what you have and use it to the glory of God, friend, I assure you, God can use you to His glory and to His honor in the kingdom. We hope this study will be profitable for each of us as we try to live faithful unto death. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, this not your lost. This is the gospel of Christ and to God We encourage you to visit the thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.